this paper is part of a larger project in which we're trying to use life insurers in order to understand aspects of the shadow banking system which really haven't been explored all that much at all. In particular, in this paper, what we're exploring is something called securities lending. I'm going to get into the mechanics of securities lending in a little bit, but before I get there, I just want to try to put in the simplest possible terms what is the question that we're exploring in this paper. So US life insurers tend to lend bonds against cash collateral in a process called securities lending. And what they do with that cash collateral is reinvest it. One way that they can reinvest it is in long-term assets. So they're lending bonds short-term, and they're reinvesting long-term. That is maturity mismatch. Right? This is a bank-like activity. And what we're trying to understand in this paper is whether insurers' maturity mismatch is what drives their securities lending programs. To preempt the main result, we find that a one standard deviation increase in maturity mismatch raises the likelihood that a given bond is lent by 11 percentage points. Before I get into the details of how we arrive at that estimate, uh, I just want to tell you why you should care about that particular result. <clears throat> so in general, when the academic literature thinks about securities lending, it doesn't think about it as an activity which involves maturity mismatch. So it tends to think that uh, it's driven by the security borrower. The security lender receives the cash and is going to reinvest it back in short-term markets, such as GC tri-party repo. And if you think about uh, Krishnamurthy, Nagel, and Orlov, the JF paper in 2014, that's really what they're trying to study. They're thinking about the tri-party repo market as associated with securities lenders. But of course, maturity mismatch renders the life insurers vulnerable to runs. So if you think about AIG during the financial crisis, AIG's securities lending program had only 20% of its reinvestment in liquid securities. Of course, AIG experienced a run, ended up biggest bailout in history. We know that story. But perhaps what you don't know is that that was commonplace throughout the securities lenders at that time. And it had a consequential effect on funding markets that were derived from securities lending cash reinvestment. So in particular, the tri-party repo funding from securities lending collapsed by $300 billion in the fourth quarter of 2008. So if you want to understand the risks to funding markets, if you want to understand the risks associated with securities lending, you need to understand why securities lenders might be engaged in this particular activity. And you need to understand in the shadow banking system as a whole where maturity mismatch arises. So <clears throat> if that's where we're going and why, how are we going to do that? So what you'd like to do, if you think about what the ideal empirical experiment would be for trying to get at uh, securities lending being driven by maturity mismatch, you could sort of imagine two life insurers with identical bond portfolios. And one of them were exogenously engaged in more maturity mismatch. And we'd like to see how the, their propensity to lend particular bonds out of those portfolios changed with respect to that exogenous variation in maturity mismatch. And that's what we're going to try to do. And to do that, we collected regulatory data, which has only been available since 2011, sort of on a quarterly, sometimes annual basis, on the bond level loan decisions at year end, and what they're reinvesting the cash collateral that they receive in. We're going to combine that with some transaction level data on the securities lending market as a whole. And that is going to allow us, we think, to overcome the two critical uh, identification challenges inherent to this exercise. Right? So one is the unobservable demand for securities borrowing. And the other is the fact that we don't see everything about these life insurers. So there's some unobservable heterogeneity in lender types or in their ability to lend these securities. OK, so if that's the roadmap for how we get about doing this, I'm guessing that a lot of people are still wondering, what is securities lending? This is a simplified securities lending transaction. Do you think about the securities lender as being an institution that holds a lot of securities on its portfolio for regulatory or business reasons? It can't sell those securities, but it can lend them. The securities borrower wants it for shorting positions, for covering naked short, for example, is going to take full economic ownership of that security 
in exchange for cash or non-cash collateral. That collateral is going to be marked to market daily. It's going to be over-collateralized. And in the US, about 80% is going to be cash collateral. The securities lender then has a decision about what to do with that. So it can invest long-term or short-term. And in addition, the contract written with the securities borrower promises a rebate, which is going to be paid back from the securities lender to the securities borrower based off of GC repo as a percentage of the cash provided to the securities lender. That's called a rebate. And the rebate is proportional to something like, sorry, the negative of the rebate is proportional to something called specialness, relative to how it compares to the GC repo rate. For those of you who are familiar with them, that lots, looks a lot like a repo transaction. But one major difference with a repo transaction is that either party is going to be able to end that lending relationship at any time. Okay. So if that's a basic securities lending transaction, we want to know how that fits into the overall map of the shadow banking system, and in particular how sort of cash reinvestment is going to tie back to this securities borrower. So here's a simplified diagram, stylistic diagram of the shadow banking system. What do you think about the cloud on the right as being sort of the general functioning of securities market? And I'm illustrating it here with a hedge fund taking a short position by borrowing the security through a broker dealer. It's going to contract with a, uh, sorry, take a position with respect to a hedge fund long through that securities market. The hedge fund long itself is going to be funding the position with funds that are borrowed through the broker dealer off of short term markets. Think tri party repo. Tri-party repo is going to be provided by money market mutual funds. The cash through tri-party repo to the broker dealer is going to come from somebody like money market mutual funds, but it can also come back around from securities lenders. <coughs> Take some portion of the cash, reinvest it back in short-term markets. That's the world of Krishnamurthy, Nagel, and Orloff. Alternatively, they can invest that cash long-term. They can create that maturity mismatch. So you can kind of see how if the hedge fund taking the short position returns the security and demands its cash back from the securities lender, the first thing the securities lender is going to do is going to go to the short-term market and pull back out its cash. And that's the collapse that you see during the financial crisis. What you're worried about is to what extent that transaction is being driven by the securities lender as opposed to being driven by the hedge fund. Right? So if if the securities lender simply invested everything in the short-term market so that it's borrowing short and lending short, this whole mechanism could simply scale up and down. No problem. The problem arises when it can't liquidate its positions in the long-term market. That's what we're worried about. So how are we going to get at this in terms of the data? Well, we have detailed statutory filings since 2011 on individual securities at the end of year of whether or not they're on loan. We also know something about the securities that they've reinvested that cash in. We know about the type of security that it's invested in, and we know something about the residual maturity associated with that reinvestment. So we're going to try to say something about how maturity mismatch on an insurer's cash reinvestment portfolio is going to be related to their decision to lend particular securities, knowing that we can observe everything on the insurer's portfolio in terms of what it could or could not lend. And we're going to combine that with detailed data on transactions in the uh, securities lending market as a whole. We also have data on uh, information about uh, the bonds themselves, but this is relatively minor compared to the two major data sets that we're interested in. So if you think about the kind of regression that we would want to run, we would put something like that binary variable for whether or not you're lending a bond on the left-hand side. And you want to put some measure of maturity mismatch on the right-hand side. So to give you a sense of what that maturity mismatch looks like, I want you to consider this figure. So in blue, what we're showing you is the weighted average maturity of the cash collateral received across insurance companies. These box plots are distributions where each insurance company is equally weighted. So from the 
upper part of the box to the top part is basic to the top line is representing 25% of the insurance companies in the industry engaged in securities lending. What you can see from the blue distribution is that the weighted average maturity of cash collateral received is short term. What you can see from the pink bars is that the weighted average maturity of reinvested cash collateral is far, far longer. Not only is there a considerable variation within those uh, uh, pink boxes, but if you were to calculate the weighted, weighted average maturity, where the first weights are the size of those insurance companies, the weighted, weighted average maturity is going to be something like 900 days. So you're getting something like a three-year maturity mismatch by this metric. So going back to that design again, where you have the lending decision on the left-hand side, and you have something like maturity mismatch on the right-hand side, what you're really interested in trying to do is to control for borrower demand. That's, your, that's your, your, your main objective here. Uh, the problem is, you might think, as a sort of a natural first step, is to use some variable from the market, for example, that rebate, right, some notion of price, for example, as a control for borrower demand. The problem with that is that it's endogenous. Not only is it endogenous with respect to the market as a whole, but the security lender themselves typically has market power over that particular security that they own. So we're providing some evidence that that is the case. We don't just take it as given. We go into the data and show you that the lending decision and the rebate which exists within the market are jointly determined. And that joint determination is exhibited at both the bond level and also at the portfolio level. What that means is that you cannot use market level variables to control for borrower demand in our regressions. You simply cannot do that. But that's, that's a non-trivial result. I want to underscore that. So how do you do it instead? Well, we're going to exploit the fact that we have entire portfolios of these insurance companies. And we're able to observe the same bond across multiple insurers. Multiple insurers who are making the same decision about whether or not to lend with variation in their own individual maturity mismatch on the cash reinvestment portfolio. So we're going to include security time fixed effects to absorb all of the variation associated with a given security at a particular point in time. Any variation in demand associated with that security is just going to end up in that fixed effect. And what we're going to be interested in is the coefficient on what we're measuring as maturity mismatch, which in this case is going to be the fraction of insurers' cash reinvestment portfolio that has a residual maturity of more than one year. There's a specific reason why we're using that metric, and I'm going to explain it a little bit later. But essentially, it relates to the extent to which uh, other institutions can participate in this market. So if that's the regression that we want to run, what do we find? We get a strong, significant, positive association between maturity mismatch and securities lending. This is going to hold just when we have straightforward insurer fixed effects. But it's also going to behold when we control for demand. That's not enough to make a causal statement about whether maturity mismatch is what is driving securities lending. Why not? Because maturity mismatch itself may not be uncontaminated by unobservable lender heterogeneity. In particular, what we're worried about is that individual bonds themselves may not be the level at which demand is being driven. What we know from the industry is that sets of bonds are often borrowed. Sets of bonds are borrowed and put together by broker-dealers on behalf of hedge funds who want to short entire indices. So if you're worried about the composition of bond holdings, or you're worried about lender ability, whether or not their lending desk is particularly good in some years or others, then you have to wor one worry 
about um, the maturity mismatch variable that we've put on the right-hand side of our regression. So what we want is some exogenous variation in the maturity mismatch that a particular insurer wants to, uh, wants to, wants to achieve. And the way that we're going to do it is through instrumental variable. And the particular instrumental variable that we're going to use is the annual change in unrealized losses as a fraction of total assets. This is, again, part of the regulatory filings of insurance companies where they are forced to mark to market and report the mark to market value of their portfolio as a whole. Right? So if you are a manager of that portfolio and you worry about the losses associated with that portfolio, and these unrealized losses, I should point out, are a, a good e predictor of actual economic losses on the portfolio, then one way that you can attenuate those losses <coughs> is by increasing the return on cash reinvestment. In other words, by lengthening the maturity mismatch on your securities lending program. The exclusion restriction that we have in mind is that this variable, this aggregate variable, is not related to the ability to lend a particular security, a particular security. And this is what we find. So in a first stage regression, the correlation between unrealized losses and uh, maturity mismatch is strong, significant. And in a second stage, we find a positive, statistically significant coefficient. We do a bunch of robustness checks to make sure that the coefficient is reasonably stable, conditional on a number of other factors that you may have in mind. We can talk about those later. In terms of interpretation, that coefficient is precisely the uh, result that I reported before. That is a one standard deviation exogenous increase in the fraction of cash reinvestment portfolio with a residual maturity of more than one year on average is going to increase the likelihood that a life insurer will lend a given bond by 11 percentage points. In terms of a policy interpretation, this is why we use that particular metric. So if you think about applying Rule 2A7, so Rule 2A7 applies to mutual funds and the extent to which they can engage in securities lending. Rule 2A7 would exclude life insurers from making any investment beyond one year, with a residual maturity of beyond one year. So we can interpret the coefficient that we just estimated with respect to eliminating the average fraction in the industry as a whole, eliminating all of that lending more than one year on all of the lending made by life insurers against cash collateral. The result is a decline in lending of $4 billion. In the scheme of things, in terms of the size of the overall lending of corporate bonds against cash, and again, let me emphasize, sorry, life insurers hold corporate bonds, tend to lend corporate bonds, this is a small percentage. What we're saying is that if you wanted to eliminate this part of the maturity mismatch, the risk associated with maturity mismatch and life insurers securities lending programs, the implication for lending into the securities market is relatively small. So let me conclude. What we're trying to offer in this paper is some evidence that maturity mismatch by US life insurers is what is driving their security, is a driver, excuse me, of securities lending programs. This is pretty important because these are the guys who caused problems in the funding market during the financial crisis. It's also important because securities lending, as we saw before, was vital to the functioning of securities markets as a whole. We'll also point out that these data that we're estimating over are post-crisis data, 2011 onwards. This maturity mismatch is going on right now and is what is driving securities lending right now. So it's not just a crisis result. And those low interest rates that we've been experiencing recently are likely to encourage securities lending as the return on the, on the life insurer's aggregate portfolio 
goes down, they have to look for alternative sources of return. One potential source is security funding. Lastly, we'll just point out that uh, the paper suggests two new financial stability metrics. Mm, those are maturity mismatch on the reinvestment portfolio of securities lenders and the cash collateral which is reinvested in short-term markets, like that tri-party repo market. Thank you very much. <laughs>